Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. My name is Will Parker. I'm a general surgery resident at Walter Reed, and today I'm going to be talking about the military experience and the management of pelvic fractures from OIF and OEF. Uh, I apologize for the uh, lack of any witty wordplay in my title, um, but that's probably because I'm a pretty boring meat and potatoes kind of guy myself. Uh, moving on to our disclosure statements, um, we have no relevant financial disclosures, um, and then additionally we have our uh, standard disclaimer from the DOD. So here is just a dramatic example of what we're going to be talking about today. So for a little bit of background, uh, pelvic fractures have an overall incidence of approximately 10% in civilian trauma. Uh, this is based on several large series, both from uh, US level one trauma centers as well as internationally. Uh, Life-threatening hemorrhage secondary to pelvic fracture is not uncommon, with about 35% of patients with isolated pelvic fracture requiring blood transfusion. Uh, additionally, uh, the morbidity and mortality associated with pelvic fracture varies uh, fairly significantly depending on the flavor of pelvic fracture that you're dealing with, um, but just uh, for some relevant examples that will come up later in the talk, uh, you have about an 8% mortality for unstable pelvic fractures, 40% if associated with hemodynamic instability, and about 50% for open pelvic fractures. Uh, we typically classify these pelvic fractures based on the force vectors applied to the pelvis and the associated patterns of fracture that we see on imaging. Uh, these three categories are anterior posterior compression fractures, or your classic open book pelvic fracture, uh, lateral compression, and then vertical shear. And then for those first two categories, they're further broken down uh, into severity. Um, now, there are important distinctions between these different categories because they're all associated with different types of concomitant injuries uh, and management as well as outcomes. Uh, lateral compression fractures are the most common type of fracture encountered in civilian blunt trauma. Um, also important to note, though, is that for vertical shear and APC fractures, there's a higher transfusion requirement, a higher need for operative intervention, as well as increased mortality. So the most common interventional therapies we talk about uh, in the case of hemorrhage secondary to pelvic fracture are non-invasive pelvic binder placement, external fixation, preperitoneal packing, uh, and catheter, and catheter angioembolization. Uh, a large multi-institutional trial from the AAST found that external fixation and angioembolization were the most common interventions employed in civilian practice. However, that varied pretty dramatically between different institutions. Uh, there are certainly some groups that have uh, published some pretty good outcomes on early use of preperitoneal packing, for instance, uh, in the case of hemodynamic instability associated with pelvic fracture. Um, so as you can see, in general, a multidisciplinary ap approach is often required for the management of these fractures, uh, and in fact, uh, a a multi, multidisciplinary protocol has been shown to increase or improve outcomes in these patients. So our hypothesis was that given this, the significantly different mechanism of injury in military conflict, uh, patterns of inter, injury and management will differ significantly from civilian trauma. So our methods, we conducted a retrospective review of combat casualties injured in Iraq and Afghanistan and cared for at our military treatment facility between November 2010 and November 2012 uh, in our Caring for Casualties database. Um, initially, data was abstracted from the uh, Department of Defense trauma registry as well as further chart review. Patients with pelvic fracture were identified using ICD-9 codes and then uh, the variables listed there were further abstracted. Once patients were identified as having pelvic fractures, uh, individual chart review was conducted in order to uh, find the young Burgess fracture classification, associated extremity amputation, uh, urgent and emergent procedures for pelvic fracture, as well as whether or not the fracture was classified as being open. Uh, procedures for urgent or emergent hemorrhage control were defined as those operations in the combat theater of operation within the first 24 hours after injury. Functionally, these were procedures that were performed at the Roll 2 or Roll 3 facilities. So for our results, our database included a total of 562 patients. 14% uh, of all comers were found to have pelvic fractures. 
Um, another important thing to note, which I'll touch on again a little bit later, is the fact that only 2% of patients in the entire uh, patient cohort had pelvic binders placed in the pre-hospital setting. So these are just some demographics uh, from the patient population that we studied. Uh, important things to note, obviously a, a very young population with our wounded warriors, uh, which is going to differ from our civilian blunt trauma population. Uh, additionally, our mean injury severity score was 31, where out of a lot of the civilian publications, uh, it lands around 15. So it's important to note that these are severely injured polytrauma patients. Um, as far as mechanism of injury, the most common was dismounted IED uh, blast injuries. Uh, we also had several gunshot wounds and then more traditional blunt trauma as well. Another important thing to highlight is that uh, the incidence of open fracture in our patient cohort was up to 70%. And as I noted before, uh, mortality from civilian trauma has been listed as high as 50% for open pelvic fracture. Also, for lower extremity amputation, uh, about 63% of our pelvic fractures uh, had lower extremity amputation, and then also list the association between bilateral uh, lower extremity fracture. So moving on to breaking down uh, the fractures that we found um, into the various different categories that we looked at. Uh, first to note is that we found that actually APC injury was the most common fracture pattern uh, found in the setting of blast injury. Uh, as I mentioned before, lateral compression fracture is the most common uh, found in civilian blunt trauma. Um, additionally, looking at the management strategies, uh, in this case for hemorrhage, uh, external fixation was the most common intervention employed, followed by preperitoneal packing. And actually, only one patient in our patient cohort needed further angioembolization at the Roll 3 facility. Uh, also, you can note that in, uh, in not insignificant amount of cases, uh, combination therapy was required to manage he hemorrhage from these fractures. So we also looked at uh, patients in general that had lower extremity amputation in our database. There were a total of 226 patients. 23% of those patients that had a single lower extremity fracture uh, were found to also have pelvic fracture uh, with a statistically significant odds ratio there. Uh, and then bilateral pelvic fracture was found to have an even higher association with pelvic fracture. So just briefly, before we get to the discussion, touching on the limitations of our study, this is obviously a retrospective study. Um, so we were at the mercy of the accuracy of documentation um, all the way from far forward back to our facility uh, in our CONUS military treatment facility. Um, there was also a significant survival bias. All the patients in our database were those that were that survived evacuation through the trauma system back to our CONUS military treatment facility. So on to discussion, uh, pelvic fracture is a common injury found in combat injured patients, again, up to 14% in all comers. Uh, and we also found that APC injuries were the most common fracture pattern encountered. Uh, this becomes important in discussion because uh, whether or not pelvic binder placement is helpful in the trauma setting um, is actually somewhat in question in the, in the literature. Uh, one of the reasons I suspect that's the case is that a lot of the literature published essentially treats pelvic fracture kind of all comers as the same when these different mechanisms of injury and fracture patterns uh, present different types of injury. For instance, with our APC injuries, you're increasing the pelvic volume and thus decreasing that volume with either pelvic external fixation or pelvic binder is more likely to have an impact. Additionally, we found a strong association between lower extremity amputation and pelvic fracture. Uh, this actually replicates some work done from uh, some of our UK colleagues, um, and has actually been implemented now in the TCCC guidelines. Uh, Preperitoneal packing and pelvic external fixation were the most uh, were often successful, as we found in our patient cohort. Now we're certainly not uh, talking about any sort of superiority of those management strategies in hemorrhage. However, in a resource limited environment, both from an actual physical resources as well as providers, uh, we think it's important to make sure that deploying surgeons are familiar and uh, competent in preperitoneal packing as well as external fixation placement. Uh, and then the last thing I just wanted to touch on as far as discussion 
is that we had a very low number of pelvic binder placement recorded. Uh, based on the current 2016 TCCC guidelines, at least simply based on lower extremity amputation, 226 patients in our, in our database uh, would have an indication for pre-hospital pelvic binder placement. And as I mentioned, only nine out of over 500 patients had that placed. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Sorry. So in conclusion, fracture patterns found in military patients differ significantly from civilian trauma. Early management with preperitoneal packing and pelvic external fixation for hemorrhage has been successful in the military population. And pre-hospital pelvic binder placement is an important area for process improvement and further research in the military setting. Any questions? <laughs>